everyone. Today, I want to talk about my most profitable and least profitable flowers that I grew in 2022. And this is really important for me to reflect upon, especially as I plan for 2023. Now, in this video, I'm gonna cover just how I determined whether a certain variety that I grew was profitable. Then I'm gonna talk about obviously the most profitable, the least profitable flowers, but then I'm also gonna talk about flowers that I think will have high potential in the future. And you'll see why they'll, why I, categorize them as high potential versus giving them either they were profitable or not. And then last but not least, because I sold at a farmer's market and I was in my first year and did not have enough flowers, I actually supplemented my flowers by buying from a local grower. And so from the extra varieties that she had, there are definitely some things that I'm going to plant because they would be super profitable for me to grow. For those of you new to my channel, my name is Jessie. I am entering to my second year of cut flower farming, and we broke ground on our current property starting our flower farm back in late March. What we did was we set aside a 40 by 90 foot plot, so it is not by any means a giant space to grow, but it was more than plenty for first year flower farmer. And we removed the first two inches of sod from the field using a rented sod cutter. And the great news was that when we lifted the sod, we saw a ton of earthworms. We knew that the prior owner was not too much into the outdoors, so he couldn't really care about what he, what his lawn looked like, which was good to my advantage because that meant he didn't spray. He didn't really do much to it. He just let it go. And that was great because we have a bunch of deer, raccoons, foxes that come. They obviously pee, they poop on there. So we knew that the soil was going to be in decent shape for our first year. Now, I also grow in very clay-ish soil. Um, you could tell because when we removed the sod, it was very, very heavy. And, you know, when we grew in that soil, like even my vegetables, they did relatively well without a ton of fertilizer. But that being said, that soil health is still not at the level where I want it to be. And it definitely impacted the profitability of a couple of varieties, which I will get into. Now, ultimately, the way that I determine whether or not a variety that I grew was profitable or not is, well, first, I know how much I grew of each variety. The harder part is to figure out how many stems did you harvest from each particular plant, especially if they're a branching variety. But I have a good idea of the number of bouquets that I sold at any given week at a farmer's market. I have a good idea of how many stems of each variety that went in that I grew. And I also have a good idea of how much I priced that stem. So using all of those numbers, I am able to ballpark which are most and least profitable for me. Now, one thing I do want you to consider is that what was profitable, not profitable for me is not going to be the same for you. We have very different growing conditions. We have very different climates. Um, we had a bit of a drought this year. You may not have had a drought, right? So all of that stuff really does make a difference because it significantly impacts the input that you put in, especially in the form of labor, water. It also impacts the amount of time that you might need for example, you might need a baby, a certain type of variety in a climate versus not baby, a variety in a different kind of climate, right? Um, we also have different types of soil, the variety that you chose or the particular type. So for example, in a Snapdragon um, category, right? There's four different groups. If you chose the wrong Snapdragon, depending on the day length or the temperature, that might also impact your output, right? So there are a bunch of things to consider, but the really important thing is for you to reflect on what you grew this year and what makes sense to grow again next year, what makes sense to grow more of, and what makes sense to potentially knock off the list of growing. All right, without further ado, let's start with our most profitable flower that I grew this year. And this was no surprise to me because I did a lot of reading online and other flower farmers also typically say that this is a top profitable crop and it was sunflowers. Now, this actually might be surprising to some of you who view sunflowers as just, you know, they're not branching. We're usually growing the single stem version. So once you cut it, you're done, you have to reseed. But for those very same reasons why um, they may not be profitable, they are very, very 
efficient from a harvesting perspective. Now, I bought a lot of sunflower seeds relative to other varieties because of what I read about sunflowers. Um, my method with them was I actually bought an earthway cedar just for the sunflowers because I knew I wanted to grow a couple hundred in each succession and I was not about to, you know, do it by hand. So I bought an earthway cedar, I think it was for like $90, best investment ever. Um, and I was able to rapidly seed about, I would say three to 400 seeds within a few minutes. So that made it very easy for a cost input piece of it because my labor was limited, right? I did not have to soil block them. I did not have to transplant them. They were direct seeded. They were seeded at the right interval. And then when they grew, they were very easy to harvest because they were one and done, right? Now, some people do grow the branching varieties, but I think most of us who are selling uh, cut sunflowers are using that single variety because they just are able to grow longer stems with a more full head. The ones that branch out tend to produce either smaller heads or like really, really big heads. So in any case, um, I, I sold at least, I would say 600 stems of sunflowers and I was able to sell them for each at a price of anywhere from a dollar to a dollar 50. Now I played around with this because I saw that when I put sunflowers into a mixed bouquet, they really elevated the value and even just the color scheme of a mixed bouquet. People love them. So I put about four sunflowers into each bouquet and these were medium sized heads. I did not go all out growing them really, really big, nor did I make them really, really small. And just a pop of yellow really, really helped the mixed bouquets. So when I put four, we'll say maybe sometimes five sunflowers in a bouquet, I value them at about $1.50 a stem, sometimes $1.75 if it was like a very special type of um, pro cut, like a plum, which you don't see often, or a white light. Now, I also tried selling sunflowers in straight bunches and those did not go as well. And I think a part of it is because, you know, the type of people coming to my farmer's market were people who are kind of looking for grocery store priced uh, flower bouquets. So you go to the grocery store and a bunch of five is like $4, right? So I was trying to sell um, basically each of them at $1.50 and that did not work very well. So ultimately I had to drop the price down to the point where I was selling each them at about $1.10 to $1.20 per stem, which still in the grand scheme is not bad because when you look at the cost of each sunflower seed, I was paying anywhere from four cents to nine cents each. So the four cents was if I was buying sunflower seeds in excess of 500 to a thousand in quantity. And the nine cents was if I was just, you know, buying a couple hundred to test out. So the preface is that I did not realize I was starting a flower farm. So I actually bought some sunflowers for my townhouse. I bought them in the lowest quantity possible. So you could see that there is a difference when you're obviously buying a much higher volume of seeds versus lower volume of seeds. But that being said, sunflowers are going to be a mainstay. The other reason why I love them so much is because sunflowers have tap roots. So I had mentioned earlier that I have very clay-ish soil, but we also had a drought this year. Now you go deep down enough, there's going to be moisture in that soil. And the sunflowers did really, really well in this drought environment. One of the things that we were considering putting in this year was irrigation. And we just, we ran out of time. And at a certain point, I was just like, you know, I want to see how certain varieties do um, based off of the weather here, right? So we have well water, which means that we don't necessarily pay for well water, but in a drought like situation, Situation, you know, people here, we we don't water our lawns because you're sharing the same aquifer. It is a common courtesy to make sure that you are, um, you know, trying to maximize the amount of fresh water that we have in our aquifer for just personal use. So we didn't put any irrigation in and the sunflowers did really, really great, right? So you're talking about a flower that had really minimal labor input, right? Because seeding is so easy. It's just the harvesting of it. Um, and then 
I didn't have to fertilize or water them at all, right? Like how much more easier could it get? And then the other piece is that everyone loves sunflowers. So one thing that I read was that you will always find the market for sunflowers. And this I found to be very, very true. Sunflowers drew people to my, my tent and it was just overall, you know, a very cheery flower to be able to grow. One other thing about sunflower is that I love the flexibility in terms of harvest. Now you have to harvest at a very, very, um, we'll call it closed stage to be able to carry over, but I was able to basically keep it for at least a week, sometimes up to a week and a half in my refrigerator if I harvested at the right stage. And I actually have a video that I'll link below around how I harvested my sunflowers to maximize their life if, um, if you want to see that. So can you tell I love my sunflowers? Um, so I would say that of all the flowers that I'm going to talk about, sunflowers basically blew it out of the park. So number two, my next most profitable flower was straw flower. Now I had only intended on growing straw flower because I wanted to dry them. And guess what? I didn't really dry any. Um, I didn't grow enough straw flower, honestly, to dry. I only grew about 15-ish plants. And, you know, they, they did really well in the fall. And I would say that over the summer, you know, I got some stems off of them here and there, but they really, really started proliferating when the weather got a little bit cooler, when there was a little bit more rainfall. So that being said, you know, 15 plants was not a lot of stems, but I was still able to sell each stem at about $1.25 each in mixed bouquets. And then I would say that each seed, when I did the calculation of it, cost me anywhere from one cent to eight cents. Um, I think that straw flowers, you know, for the future are going to stay on the farm. Again, they are great for drying. Um, people are now starting to recognize that straw flower can be dried, that there are flowers out there that are more conducive to drying. And even if people aren't looking to dry, I think there is a novelty about how papery a straw flower is. And it's always one of those things that people comment on when they look at a mixed bouquet, like, oh, what is that? You know, the coloring is really cool. It's got a really cool texture. So it's also a great conversation starter in that sense. All right, my third most profitable flower was the Snapdragon. And this is considering that I had to let basically a crop or a row of Snapdragon basically go because there were thrips in it. So it kind of tells you the potential that snapdragons have. Now, snapdragons are, they happen to be one of my favorite flowers. I had, they're, they're one of the few flowers that I actually ever grew before. And I just find it so cool that such a tiny little seed, you know, can, can generate such a very robust and tall stem. So, you know, the first part about snapdragon is that the seed is relatively cheap because of how small it is and how much it produces. It also means that it is a colossal pain to start seed, especially to soil block. So I typically start my, if I start my seed, I typically soil block. So I'm taking a toothpick and literally uh, taking each seed and putting it into a soil block. But anyway, so I would say I grew about 250 sellable stems. I probably grew over six, 700 stems. A lot of them, as I said, had to basically just, you know, go into the compost pile because there were thrips in them and I didn't really want to sell um, snapdragons, especially because I had very light color snapdragons with thrips in case that they were crawling out of the flower head. But anyway, the seed cost me one to three cents each. And the three cents is on the high end because I was buying lower quantities of more specialty type of colors like the Costa Apricot series from Johnny's and that kind of stuff, right? Um, what I did was I also bought plugs from Farmer Bailey's and the plugs came out to about 25 cents on paper. I say 25 cents on paper because each plug came with at least two snapdragons. Uh, some of them came with three snapdragons. And that's when I learned that you can really cram snapdragons together into a single Horta Nova square. So, um, you know, you can fit a lot into a very, very small space. So I would say that the realistic price per plug was actually around like 12 cents each on average. And I got two flushes out of the plugs that I bought. And it was the second flush that I was able to use 
to sell at a farmer's market. So that being said, when I put Snapdragons or, you know, I was able to sell Snapdragons both in a mixed bouquet as well as in a straight bunch. And that is why I love Snapdragons because when you get the right color combination, it just, it looks so, um, it looks so like almost fluffy, but it's just, it's a gorgeous bouquet with just being a straight bunch and they smell wonderful too. So I was able to sell each stem at roughly a dollar to a dollar 25 each. I priced the, um, the taller and the more sturdier Potomac ones at a dollar 25 in my mixed bouquets. Um, and in my straight stems, they were basically selling for about a dollar each. Um, I will say that I grew some Madame Butterfly, which although very, very beautiful, produce a bit shorter of a stem. So they were not like florist quality, but I was able to sell those in those straight bunches. And typically I put like 10 stems for $12 and they all sold at the farmer's market. So I also got some great photos with Snapdragons. I mean, there's nothing that looks better than, you know, these long sturdy stems of just Snapdragons with these full heads over your shoulder, right? So I would fully, fully grow Snapdragon again, and I would probably buy it from plugs. Now I do have Snapdragons actually wintering outside. So we're gonna see how they do in my zone 6B. All right, I have one more flower for the most profitable uh, category, and that is Celosia. So I had tried selling, or I tried starting Celosia from seed, was a little bit unsuccessful because I was starting them at a time when I was moving, so I was neglecting them, and luckily I had actually decided to buy them from plugs. And I actually bought them late from plugs. I got them in about, I think it was mid July. So I thought that, you know, we'll run this as an experiment, see if they grow. They flourished, especially in the month of September. I bought, it was sold in a tray of 216 plugs from Farmer Bailey's. I got the Celosia Selway. And let me tell you, the amount of stems I got, like I could not have enough time to harvest. The tricky thing about Celosia is that you do have to harvest them at that right time or else they start going to seed, which is not necessarily a bad thing because you can always tell your customers, hey, if black stuff starts dropping out of it, it's seed, it's not a bug. So I had some customers who were hoping that seed would drop out of the Celosia that I sold them, except I picked them at the right time, so there was no seed. But anyway, I grew over 500 stems um, or I picked about 500 stems. I would say I probably left about 800 stems in the ground. Um, uh, so when you divide out the cost of a tray, each plug came at about 25 cents each. And similar to Snapdragon, some of them had a couple per plug, but most of them had about one per plug. So I'm going to keep them at 25 cents each a plug. Um, so I would say that, you know, they were a great filler. Um, they came, uh, I, I bought a mixed color tray. So, you know, in the fall, when I didn't have a lot of other types of filler, I was able to basically put like five or six loja into a bigger mixed bouquet and, you know, really able to just give it that texture and that pop of color. Now, I think the disappointing thing for me was I did try harvesting a couple of buckets for dried flowers. And yes, they sold, but they didn't sell at a price that I would have deemed it as adequate for the time and the drying process, right? So ultimately the fresh and the dry both sold roughly at about 50 cents each a stem. So with that, you know, I'm not going to dry Celosia. Um, I do think that the farmer's market was not the right market for selling dried bouquets, you know, selling dried bouquets for people who are doing weddings, um, selling them online, selling them floors is probably a much better route. So I will actually be growing Celosia again next year. I saved a bunch of seed from those plugs and uh, there were a bunch that were left outside, which I fully expect them to self reseed again for next year. So that brings me into the least profitable flowers that I grew category. The first one is going to be a surprise for a lot of you, and that is zinnias. So I'm actually not going to put a number on this. Um, I grew a ton of zinnias, and there were a couple lessons I learned. First, I chose the wrong variety. I decided to put all my eggs, or like 90% of my eggs, into the Queen Lime series basket, or just the Queen series as a whole. I grew Queen Blush, Queen Lime, Queen Orange, Queen Pink. Um, I grew a ton of queens, and what I didn't expect was one, the heads are 
a lot smaller than the zinnias that I'm used to from like the Benary Giants, right? So it did not make them a great focal flower. They were great accent flowers. But the second thing is that the Queen series are a little bit more, how do you say, susceptible to disease. And that was the number one reason why my zinnias were not profitable. They got overtaken by powdery mildew within the first month. And I attribute a lot of that more to my soil health than anything else. I mean, we had, it was... Remember, it was a relatively dry summer because we had a drought. It was humid, but at the end of the day, there wasn't a ton of rain. So it was kind of confusing to me as to how bad the powdery mildew was. And even if I planted the zinnias in a different part of the, the plot, which I did, they still got overtaken by powdery mildew. So I would say that if I could rewind, I would have bought a lot more of the Benary Giants variety because they are a lot more resistant to powdery mildew. The other thing was for the dahlia seeds that I did not buy in the Queen series, I bought in white and creamy colored, or which, which, which is this like buttery yellow color. Bad mistake because you could see all of the imperfections that were done by the pests. So I couldn't use them either. But you know what? They were great for the pollinators and the pollinators love them. So zinnias though can be a very profitable crop. And case in point from the local grower who I bought stems to supplement from. She sold me a lot of zinnias. They were next to my sunflowers, a great complementary focal for those Benary giants. She has fantastic soil health. She got multiple flushes out of her zinnias to the point where one day we we're standing there and she's like, I'm just going to rip out this entire bed because I have too many zinnias, right? So it all goes to show that, you know, zinnias were not profitable for me, but they could be profitable for you. I would just keep in mind the types of varieties that you're growing and whether or not you have powdery mildew in your area. All right. So one other thing about zinnias that I hated was that once they got established and, you know, they were rooted and they grew multiple stems, they were a pain in the butt to rip out especially with powdery mildew. I was wearing a mask. I was like, I, I mean, I felt like I should be like in a hazmat suit almost because there was, there were spores going everywhere, right? So um, I remember that like, I, I wasn't gonna go compost them because of the powdery mildew. So I had to use trash bags and I basically filled up three trash bags worth of zinnias after stomping and compacting down the zinnias. So after that, I was like, you know what, I'll grow a few next year, but I'm not going to grow a ton. Um, and it is a shame because zinnias are really, really great as a local cut flower, um, especially if you're selling to florists and those people who can't get that from a wholesaler. All right, moving on. Next least profitable flower was Gomfrina. Now, again, Gomfrina is a flower that you can dry. So there are a couple of reasons why I'm not going to be growing as many Gomfrinas as I did this year, I grew 40. That was a mistake. Unless if you are um, a bigger scale farm, you have some help, you are planning on drying the heck out of Gumfrina, I would not recommend growing 40 plants of Gumfrina. Maybe five is enough. So <laughs> I grew 40, had way too many stems for what I needed for. Um, and when I cut them to dry them, they really dried small. So I had to basically put, 30 together in a bunch to sell and they were not selling well even at $15 at my farmer's market. Again, probably a better cut flower to sell online like on an Etsy or to an event planner or to a person who is doing their own wedding with dry flowers. The farmer's market was not the route for it. And I don't need to tell you, but Comfrina is another pain to harvest. Uh, it's just, it's the way it branches. It's the way you have to get in. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, I wouldn't say that it really provided a lot of substance for my mixed bouquets. Like, yes, it was cool to see a couple of balls pop up here and there, but did it significantly make or break my bouquet? No. Right. So this is why, um, you know, I don't even know if I'm going to plant five next year. I may just skip it all together. Cosmos, next flower. So Cosmos are one of those very, very delicate flowers that can be very, very profitable, especially if you're selling to a florist because they're not going to be able to get that from a wholesaler. The problem was I grew the wrong variety. No one told me that Xenia basically is a variety that's going to be very compact and very, very short. And unfortunately, the majority of Cosmos that I bought came from the Xenia series, so I cannot use a single stem. The color was a great wine-colored 
type of Cosmo, but it didn't matter because it was not going to work in my bouquet. I did grow a few white Cosmos. I'm actually not even sure what the variety is. I couldn't find the name of seed, but those did a lot better. Um, what I did not like about them though, was that they did not hold up well against the rain. They would start getting very fragile um, and they just kind of um, turned a little bit more like dirty in color if it was like a really hard rain. So you have to be, be able to harvest them at the right time to put them in a bouquet. But you know, I will say they definitely elevated a mixed bouquet if they were in there. So the variety that I would grow in the future is the Versailles series. My local growers also sold me a few stems of Cosmos. Um, they were Versailles and they were perfect. They were really, really big. And I would say that they even had a relatively good vase life for a Cosmo. Like they were able to make it to four to five days when picked at the right time. Um, last but not least, I'm not going to go into detail about this because if you've been following, you've seen videos that I've done on this. Lee's profitable flower was stock. I really did not get much out of it for the amount that I grew, for the amount of plugs that I bought. So, you know, stock will be one of those things where it will probably get a place in my garden because I'm just stubborn and I want to figure it out. But at the end of the day, stock is typically difficult to grow um, in non-temperate climates because it likes a very specific type of temperature. That being said, if you can grow it and you are selling to a florist, you can make a lot of money with stock. Let's talk about high potential flowers in the future, which means that these are flowers that I will still be growing. So the first one to no one's surprise is dahlias. Now, I did not want to grow or I did not want to invest in tubers my first year because I wasn't sure how my soil was going to be. I had never really even grown flowers before, right? So to start getting into tubers for me was a little bit of a stretch. That being said, there was a YouTube viewer who actually sent me free tubers. It was really nice of her. And I started a few from seed. And the reason why I think that these have high potential is because obviously in a non drought year, this was a pretty difficult year for a lot of farmers who grew dahlias. But in a non drought year, obviously they are relatively long in terms of a window for harvest. Um, and they fetch a higher price point, right? So for the dahlias that I ended up getting in quantity, I would say they really started in September, October, um, late August, early S September is when we started getting rain, like consistent rain that we normally get. And dahlias did really, really well. So I was actually selling dahlias um, wholesale to local farmers for anywhere from, I would say, a dollar for a really small dahlia to up to $2.50 for a bigger dahlia. So that was nice to be able to fetch those kind of prices at wholesale. And of course I put them into bouquets. I would only put about one dahlia into a single mixed bouquet. I think if next year I were to grow more dahlias, um, I'm gonna grow a lot from seed because I like the thrill of finding out what you grow from seed, even though it's not the most profitable. The bees love the ones that I don't cut for cut flowers. Um, but the other thing is I would grow a lot more of the ball varieties because of the longer vase life. I had a lot more of the decorative type of dahlias this year, which, you know, no shade to them. They look beautiful, but they typically last, I would say about three, three days in a vase. The ball dahlias are going to get you at least about a week in a vase. So I would probably invest my money in those kind of tubers. Second flower with a lot of potential is Rudbeckia. And the reason why they are not on the profitable list this year is because I had a bit of a hard time germinating my first um, tray of soil blocked Rudbeckia. And then when I went to go do my second, the wind blew away my seed packet. So I did not have a lot of Rudbeckia. I think I had maybe about five plants uh, that ultimately uh, grew from the seed that I bought. And from those five plants, you know, I saw a lot of potential from them. They were growing in the cold. They obviously took off during the fall when it was a little bit cooler. Um, they provided a really good complementary, kind of like the way zinnias do to a sunflower. So I really love them in a bouquet. And, you know, there's so many different kinds of colors and they will perennialize, right? So it makes them a really great investment. And I actually have a lot of Rubeckia overwintering in my field right now. And I expect to get a first flush in the spring. The third one is ranunculus. So the reason why these again were not super profitable for me was because I had to grow them in a crate since we were moving. Um, I obviously could not overwinter them, but that is kind of the takeaway that I got from 
growing and reading about growing ranunculus in my current zone is that in order to maximize the profitability out of them, you really do need to be overwintering them. You need to be taking advantage of the, um, the winter and letting them establish their roots and all that stuff. And then basically the short days that come with early spring, they're going to start taking off and it's going to give you a much longer harvest window than if you start them out in the spring. So um, I unfortunately got COVID when I got my flush of ranunculus in, so I never was able to sell them. But just talking to my florists right now, you know, they are like, you have ranunculus, right? So it's a good sign. I have um, a first succession that is actually, or I have two sachets, two secessions that are overwintering outside. They have fortunately survived the little uh, cold freeze that like two thirds of the country had. I'll actually be doing a video about just my process of overwintering them um, in a couple of weeks, but um, I will still be putting out some in the spring just to make sure that I have, um, you know, secessions. And the other thing to consider about ranunculus is that the quorums can really vary in price. Um, the quorums can go as low as like 17 cents a quorum, maybe even lower, to dollars for a quorum, right? You know, you've got the higher end, like the butterfly ranunculus, which is a very, very particular type of ranunculus that, you know, if you have a florist who wants it, like you can make a lot of money off of that. You've also got like the romance series, which um, are a patented type of quorum. So those cost a bit more money. But you've also got something like the Aviv, which is what I stuck to. The Aviv are a very simple bread for cut flower farming type of ranunculus. You know, do they look like romance? No. But who is your market, right? And my market is or was primarily in 2022 that direct to consumer customer in the farmer's market or on Facebook marketplace, they were not going to pay extra for a more fancy type of ranunculus. Now, that being said, I am planning on selling to a florist, so we'll see how they do this year. But, you know, the difference between a 17 cent quorum and a, we'll call it a $1.50 quorum, you know, impacts your ultimate output, even though a single quorum should give you multiple stems. So I'm excited to see how ranunculus do for me this year. I have one more flower in the potential bucket, and that is basil. Um, I really struggled with basil this year because of our drought and I did not water them to the extent that they needed to in order to produce that lush foliage. That being said, my last succession came in at a time when there was rain and they were amazing and they were not even a variety of basil that I bought for cut flowers. I got them as free seed for, from my personal vegetable garden from Baker Creek and they were the cardinal variety. And I love them because the leaves were such a vibrant green, but it produced this like um, mahogany purple head that made it perfect for fall bouquets. And it really gave the bouquet like fill, right? Which is what filler is supposed to do. So, um, you know, I, I'm going back and forth on how much basil I want to plant next year for my, my flower field. Um, it's really going to depend on whether or not florists want them. So the last category is what I bought from my local grower that was super profitable, at least for her, and that would make me want to grow them. So the first one is mountain mint. Now, mountain mint is different from other mints in the sense that it has more of a vertical bush habit. It is not invasive like other mints, and it looks different from other mints. It is beautiful. To me, it has this color of similar to like eucalyptus. I would buy just a bucket of this from my local grower because it made such a great filler and it was beautiful. It was long lasting. It smelled fantastic. And if you can, like, I don't think you can uh, start seed for mountain mint, but you would have to buy it as, you know, like, like as a, as a grown, um, established plant. And if you can get it, it's obviously going to get bigger and multiply each year. So it makes for a very profitable type of filler and is definitely something that I am looking into next year once I figure out our landscaping situation and where I can put it. The second one is something called Silver Shield. Now, Silver Shield, I feel, is starting to get a little bit more popularity with more people growing it. The seed is astronomically expensive. However, if you have a florist or some sort of event work person who you are selling stems to, this 
can actually fetch you a lot of money. It is kind of like a more pastelli green dusty Miller, but this stuff is robust. I still have a couple of stems in water from from Silver Shield that was probably harvested in September and I'm going to try to root them in the spring, but they are beautiful. They've got this great color and they really really enhance a bouquet. So I would definitely look into it, but you will be a little bit sticker shocked by the price of the seed. Last but not least, this one was next to the mountain mint, my favorite, Lambada or Bee Balm. Um, this stuff is not like, it is great as a filler because it is big, it is dense, it's got a lot of green, and it also has a bit of a flower head, right? So it kind of doubles as both a filler and to me, like a spike texture in a bouquet. When I had my, my bigger sunflowers and some bee balm, I would actually put about four to five stems of sunflowers plus four stems of the lambada, and I would call it a day with a bouquet, and I, I was able to sell those for about $17 to $20 at the farmer's market. Super, super profitable, and it makes it look big, filling and just very, very warm and inviting. So definitely something that I want to grow next year. Um, I actually got some seedlings for those back in, I think it was late July, early August, put them in the ground. Um, unfortunately, the ground was too dry. So they kind of just like languished there. I didn't get a flush out of them, but they are still alive after that cold freeze. So they're supposed to be perennial to zone seven, or I guess over winter down to zone seven. So we'll see if I get a flush from those next year. All right, so I hope this video was helpful for you. If not, um, from the sense of thinking about how I think about what is profitable, what is worth growing next year, what is not, there are a couple of key takeaways for you. Um, one is who are you selling to? That really makes a huge difference in terms of what you should be growing, um, how much you should be spending on certain types of specialty varieties, right? Like. I mentioned with ranunculus, you know, do you pay at the higher end of the corms or can you get away with the lower end of the corms, right? Um, the second thing to think about is just what is your climate, right? What are the natural things that work for you and work against you in the field and how does that impact your input and output? And the third thing is just what do you enjoy growing, right? Like I did not enjoy growing gumfrina because of the harvesting experience. I really enjoyed sunflowers because of the harvesting experience, right? And that makes a huge difference because you don't want to burn out growing something that you do not like. So anyway, I would love to hear in the comments what was profitable, not profitable for you in 2022 and what you plan to grow more of. So I'll see you next time.